Hey, there we go. Server side development and rock and roll. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hi. Oh. Morning, everyone. Hi, guys. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. My turn to talk now. Okay. Time for software. Can you hear me? I'm going to start. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Seth Vargo. I'm the director of evangelism at HashiCorp. Um, I've been there for about two years now. Um, prior to that, I worked at uh, Chef. How many people have heard of Chef? Cool. Um, so if you start talking about Puppet, I, you're supposed to tell Ben that I'm not happy with you or something. <laughs> if you haven't heard of HashiCorp, uh, which I found is actually very rare in Israel, um, Here's some of the open source tools we make. So we're an open source company. Uh, we make Vagrant, which is a tool for virtualized development environments, Packer, Surf, Console, Terraform, Vault, Nomad, Auto, and our commercial product, Atlas. So before we get started, I kind of find it's important to always take a step back and answer the why question. Like, why would you use Console? And it turns out that um, the answer is that we're moving to like a microservice-oriented or a service-oriented architecture where we have these tiny microservices that do one thing and they do it really well. And this is super great for development because you have isolated development dependencies and you know, teams can focus on individual things. But it becomes operationally more complex. You have things like, how do I identify a service? How do I talk to the closest database service? How do I talk to the closest online order processing service? So while we fixed one problem, we introduced new challenges. Particularly, there are three like, main challenges or focuses in service-oriented architecture. Um, the first is that your applications need to be autonomous. That means they need to operate entirely on their own. They have to have limited scope. We have to well-define our operational scope. And lastly, they have to have a loose coupling. So we don't want our applications to tightly depend on anything else in the system. So if we imagine like a traditional, let's just say, e-commerce application, we have like a front-end web app where people go on and they add things to the cart. But then whenever they click buy, that actually goes to some back-end order processing, credit card processing. That could be many different microservices. But we also have background jobs that does things like product forecasting or pre-marketing so that we can display you know, advertisements or um, other products that you might be interested in. And then ultimately, uh, all of that gets fed into some back-end database like you know, Postgres or if you really hate your life, MongoDB. And, um, you know, like an order history database. So if we break this down into, I don't get my head out of the way. If we break this down, you know, the first challenge here is how does the web app talk to the order processing component? So, um, you know, I, I have all these microservices and I have my web app and my web app needs to tell my order processing service that there's a new order and here's the data. It needs to send some JSON payload or some RPC payload. Well, how does it do that? Well, the, the first logical thing is like, oh, I'll just hard code an IP address. Well, that obviously doesn't scale. So this becomes like a service discovery problem, particularly when you have a pool of web app servers and a pool of order processing servers. The second problem becomes load balancing. So if you have multiple order processing services, how do you ensure that requests are properly round robin or balanced based off of distance from you know, the closest or um, least burdened instance? And a traditional anti-pattern there is that you shove a load balancer in front of it. So you put like HAProxy or Nginx in front of your order processing services. So now you have that same well-known IP address that you can hard code in your web app. So you, you pretend that you don't need service discovery. But what you've really done is you've implemented a single point of failure in front of your order processing. So now when your proxy goes down or your load balancer goes down, you can't send orders to your order processing service. Then you have an interesting problem, which is how do you avoid sending traffic to unhealthy hosts? So you have all these order processing nodes, and let's say one of them is out of memory. You obviously don't want to send more jobs because it's not going to be able to process them. So how do you have health checking built in with your load balancer such that your web app never sends unhealthy traffic to uh, an order processing node that's not ready to receive it? And then more importantly, and this seems a little bit out of left field, but it actually becomes incredibly important in a service-oriented architecture, is how do you push dynamic runtime configuration to these nodes? So let's say I want to enable a feature flag, or I want to put a particular node in maintenance mode. How can I do that effectively without taking down the entire application, without forcing you know, a puppet run or a chef client run across my entire cluster just to reach some convergence state? 
So these are the four basic problems in SOA or microservices architecture. You have the service discovery component. How do I find the things? You have your load balancing, which is how do I uh, accurately balance the weight across those things? And then closely tied to that is health checking. How do I make sure that I'm not sending um, traffic to bad nodes? And then somewhat out of left field, but actually closely related, is like a distributed key value store, where you can quickly turn and toggle feature flags that implement runtime components um, that you might need to tune on the fly. So you might have heard of some of the existing solutions, and I always find that it's helpful to draw parallels. Um, so you have a tool like Zookeeper, and Zookeeper is service discovery, but it doesn't have that distributed key value store. It doesn't have the built-in load balancer. You have etcd, which is a distributed key value store, but doesn't do the service discovery component out of the box. And then you have like Sensu, which is very similar to Nagios, like an open source monitoring solution, but it's not going to do load balancing. It's not going to do any of the service discovery components. And then you have SmartStack, um, which does a lot of these things, um, but not really at scale. So we looked at the marketplace, and that's why we wrote Consul. So this is kind of the story of Consul, the problems that it's trying to solve. So I want to talk about each of those four components individually. So the first is service discovery. So how many people work in like a microservices-oriented architecture? OK. Not as many, not as many hands as, as before. But that's OK. So um, console service discovery is implemented in two ways. There's an HTTP API, meaning you can curl and wget, and you can also build tooling directly into other languages. And for ease of use, there's a built-in DNS API. So what does the DNS API look like? Whoa. So what does the DNS API look like? So uh, if you're familiar with dig, it's just a way to look up a DNS record. So if we dig for anything at the .console address, we can actually get the results from that query. So in this case, we're querying for any service named web frontend, and we get back the list of frontend nodes, and their IP addresses come back as A records. So what that means is that uh, imagine you have like a Rails application or a Python application, and instead of trying to identify like where the nearest database is, you can just point at database.service.console, and your you know, kernel-level DNS lookups will automatically do the routing, and the DNS is round robin So the second thing I want to talk about is that console is multi-data center aware. So this is something that uh, traditionally um, companies that have global scale or multiple availability zones struggle with. So console's architecture is designed in a way where you have a client and server model. And the clients and the servers all communicate in a gossip protocol. So they kind of operate in a mesh. And they all communicate with their nearest neighbors. Anytime they want to make a query, they communicate with a server. And this, there's a, a leader election that happens within the server. So if a server is a follower, it forwards requests to the leader. The leader serves requests and is responsible for replication to the followers. So any requests that happen within a data center are made directly to that server's data centers. Now, in the event that you have like a multi-data center architecture, uh, and I suppress the clients in this diagram, what happens is they participate in what's called a WAN gossip. So what this means is, let's say you're running an AWS and you have stuff in you know, a, uh, the European data center and a US-based data center, you can still communicate with services across those data centers over the public internet because the servers participate in what's called a WAN gossip. So they'll communicate with each other over the public internet. So this allows you to have a client in the first data center that's communicating with a client in the second data center, but they never have to know each other's IP addresses. They never have to know anything else. They just query the other data center. The next thing I want to talk about are host and service level health checks. So console has built-in support for a couple different kinds of health checks. And I want to show this via console template. And I was going to show a live demo, but it's not working. So we're just going to go with the slide approach. So console template is a tool that watches console service registry. And in the event that a health, uh, the health status of a service changes, it re-renders configuration. So in this case, we have a template that is basically rendering out like some Nginx or HA proxy configuration. And those instances there, that web 0, web 1, and web 2, are dynamically registered with console. So what happens is, in the event that we take one of those web servers offline, which I'm faking it here by just stopping the web server, but you can imagine if the instance ran out of memory or it lost network connectivity, what will happen is the moment that registers with console, which in a live demo is roughly like 
30 to 40 milliseconds. Uh, console, will, console template will rewrite that HA proxy configuration and stop sending traffic to that unhealthy node. So what that means is that you have minimal, if any, downtime because console's monitoring the health of your nodes, not like Nagios or Sensu where you're waiting on some interval. Everything's edge triggered. So you get as close to real time as possible where your only latency is the actual kernel and network latency itself. Because everything is based on a push model, not a pull model. And the same is true the opposite direction. As soon as we bring that web server back online, or if you imagine we add more capacity to our cluster, it's automatically going to get added to the load balancer. So if you imagine you're you know, the New York Times and you publish this massive story, and all of a sudden you're getting a lot of traffic, you can just increase your cluster capacity. You don't need to reconfigure your load balancers. As soon as the nodes become available and report themselves as healthy, they get added to the load balancer to start receiving traffic. And then the last component is the distributed key value store. And the distributed key value store is only available via the HTTP API, so there's no DNS interface for it. But it looks like this. So this is a simple curl command to create a key. So I'm creating a key uh, named foo, and I'm setting the data equal to bar. And we can get that data back out. Um, so it's very straightforward, very simple. Uh, it behaves a lot like S3 in that you can have long paths and trees and nested things, um, but under the hood they're actually stored in a flat database. Everything runs in memory, so it's super, super fast. Um, if you're curious why the value doesn't come back as bar, it's because it's um, base64 encoded. And the reason it's base64 encoded is that you can put arbitrary binary data or pretty much anything in the key value store, and the only safe way to store that is via base64. So you could store images or anything less than four kilobytes in size in the key value store and get them back out. So uh, I always like to kind of advertise. So yes, it's an open source product, but it's actually used by some of the largest companies in the world. Um, so how many people are familiar with Twitch? So they do live video game streaming. I think at last uh, rate they were pushing terabytes of data, um, terabytes of video streaming data. Uh, Cisco is obviously a very large everything. Um, Stripe is one of the largest credit card processors, uh, online credit card processors in the US. Um, Square, which is a, like an on-site credit card processor. These are just some of the companies that are using console at massive scale. Um, more recently, we brought on companies like Datadog um, that are pushing hundreds of thousands of requests per second. So it scales pretty significantly. So let's talk a little bit about health checking. Do I have to restart this? OK. I did have to restart it. Um, so let's talk a little bit about health checking. So why is health checking so closely related to service discovery? And, and traditionally, it hasn't been, but it turns out it's very important. So if you take a look at um, a health check in console, a health check is any command that returns an exit status, which is any command. So there's built-in health checks for like HTTP, like is this thing returning a 200 response code? But then you can also shell out to anything on the system. So you can write a Ruby script, you can write a Python script, a Node.js script, and the exit status of that script determines the status of the health. So if it's zero, that's like all good. If it's one, it's warning, and anything else is failing. So some use cases for warning might be, let's say you're issuing a, a, a health check that checks the memory on a machine. Well, their memory is not like a yes or no thing. It's not a very binary, you have memory or you don't. Instead, your memory usage is based off of some percentile. So your organization may set up rules that's like, if we're above 70% memory usage, we want to warn. And then once we hit 80% or 90% memory usage, we want to immediately fail. So that's the console gives you that flexibility to have a warning threshold in addition to an error threshold. Um, the output of a check is captured as a note for inspection. So uh, if you have a script and you get the output of that script, that actually gets stored in console. So you can get the output of why your check failed. And here's what it looks like to create a check. So here's a simple like memory utilization check. It's a tiny Python script that already exists on the system. And we're going to run that every 10 seconds. So every 10 seconds, we're going to ask console to uh, execute this script. And if the exit status of that script is 0, we're good. If it's 1, we're warning. If it's anything else, we're going to mark this node as failing. There's also built-in checks, as I said. So there's a built-in HTTP check, and there's a built-in TCP check. Those are just basically liveness checks. But the health checks actually allow us to do things like be responsive. And I don't mean like, you know, Hello, there's supposed to be a giant red X. There it is, okay. And I don't mean, 
it's eventually consistent. And I don't mean, uh, I don't mean like bootstrap responsive. So if you talk about like a traditional monitoring service, and what I mean by traditional monitoring is like Nagios or Sensu, you have this kind of architecture where uh, every n seconds, like let's say in some interval, every five to 10 seconds, every single node in your cluster is going to talk to your central monitoring server and say, hey, I'm alive. Hey, I'm still here. Hello, hello. It's like that Adele song. The problem is that this creates a silo, and it's a central point of failure within your organization. And then furthermore, there's no easy way for your Nagio server or your Sensu server to talk back to those nodes. So there's no way for your monitoring solution without other orchestration to be able to get into those nodes to make intelligent decisions. So you can't tell your monitoring solution to go restart a service for you. It doesn't have access. And if it does, that's kind of scary. So the problem there is that in, in the traditional monitoring solution, the monitoring talks to a human, an operator, or an engineer, and that engineer then has to manually touch those machines. The problem seems to be that that only happens when like stuff's on fire, um, and that only seems to happen at like 3 o'clock in the morning whenever people are trying to sleep. So when you talk about consoles monitoring, you'll notice that the arrows here are bidirectional. And the reason for that is that every node has a local console agent, and that console agent can receive commands and receive messages from the console servers. So what does that actually look like? So let's say all of our nodes are healthy. When we ask the DNS to return us all of the list of nodes, we get all three nodes in this case. If one of those nodes becomes unhealthy, let's say web1 dies, runs out of memory, goes offline, immediately the DNS results remove that. So you never send traffic to an unhealthy node. Which means if your application is sending traffic to like, you know, web.service.console, it's only gonna route traffic to those two healthy nodes. And it's never gonna send traffic to that unhealthy node. But in the event that node comes back online or we add a new node to the cluster, it immediately gets added to the pool and can start receiving traffic. So unhealthy nodes are not returned from DNS queries, and unhealthy nodes are not returned from the HTTP queries. So they behave the same. So let's talk about locking. So another important component of a service-oriented architecture is that occasionally you have tools and services that are unable to run in a highly available environment. Um, maybe that's because they're not designed, they're sharing some storage backend, or it's impossible to run them in HA. And a good example of that is like Redis or Vault, where you have to do a lot of work to run two Redis processes on the same instance at the same time in a highly available way. So with console lock, we actually uh, have the ability to create HA around services that don't have built-in high availability. So uh, Vault, which is another one of our open source tools, can't have built-in HA for a number of reasons, um, so we build HA in a little bit different. So what happens is whenever Vault launches, it asks Console for a lock. So Console's a distributed systems tool, so it has like built-in semaphores and it has the ability to generate a global lock within your data center. So when all three Vault instances ask for a lock, one of them will get the lock and the other two will go into standby mode. In the background, they're still gonna keep trying to acquire that lock, but Console's gonna tell them, hey no, somebody else has the lock and it'll tell them the address of the leader. So this is how the other vault servers discover each other in the system, and they discover who the leader is. Now, in the event that you make a request, when a request is made to any of the followers in the system, they automatically get forwarded back up to the leader. In the event that the leader goes down, so in this case, vault one died, what will happen is it will lose its lock in console. And the result is that those other two servers we're consistently trying to acquire a lock, so what they'll do is one of them will win, in this case Vault 3 won, Vault 2 goes into standby mode, Vault 1 gradually fades into the abyss, and what you have is now any secret, any request that's made to Vault 2 gets forwarded to Vault 3. So um, nothing's complete without like an animated GIF, but this is a real life thing. If you've ever seen like puppies or piglets, when you put them around a milk bowl, each of them try to get more milk, so they'll push each other around, and it, it's a real thing called pinwheeling. Um, but that's, uh, this is the best way to describe console lock, is it's like just a continuous circle. Um, but if you're interested in like animals, look this up, it's super fascinating. So uh, console lock provides um, 
the ability to do things like HA. Console lock is also really great for things like rolling semaphores, where you need to do something like rolling restarts or rolling kernel upgrades. So if you um, pass in like a number to the console lock, that's the number of things that can acquire a lock. The default value is one. But let's say you have a cluster of 50 machines and you need to upgrade the kernel on all of them. Obviously, you don't want to upgrade all 50 kernels all at once because you'll have downtime and it might not work. But you might want to upgrade two at a time. So with console lock, you have the ability to upgrade your entire fleet in one command by only doing like two at a time. And if any of those commands fail, if that machine fails to come back online, whenever you upgrade the kernel, it'll stop the command execution and you can investigate why and you've only lost like two servers or four servers. So another thing I want to talk about is scalability. So in uh, traditional monitoring with like Nagios or Sensu, you have this like TTL-based ping where every, every so often, the, all of the nodes in the cluster have to talk to the main server and say, hey, I'm alive, hey, I'm still here, hey, I'm still here. So what that does is that creates thousands of requests per second to your main monitoring solution. And then you end up putting HA in front of your monitoring solution, and then you add monitoring to your monitoring. So you have a monitoring solution to monitor your monitoring solution so that if it goes down, you're not missing any monitors. And console takes like a very different approach. So console's bidirectional nature only notifies on state change. So what that means is that we only send a request whenever something joins the cluster, whenever something state changes from good to bad, bad to good, warning to bad, which results in tens of requests per second instead of thousands of requests per second, even on incredibly large clusters. So the result there is that instead of overloading your cluster, in, even in the event of like massive failure where all of your nodes are down, you're still only sending hundreds of requests at maximum as opposed to thousands and thousands of requests. So you're not congesting your network with unnecessary TTL pings, you're only sending state change. So this does raise an interesting question, which is, if a node goes down, how does console know that it goes down? So with something like Nagios or Sensu, if it doesn't get that TTL ping every five or 10 seconds, then it's gonna say, oh, your node is down, I'll notify somebody. But in the event of like console, there, there is no TTL ping. How can console possibly know that a node is down? And this is the advantage and the scalability of the gossip-based protocol, is because everything's together in a mesh, the nodes around a particular node will report a node is missing. And the metaphor I like to draw here is like in high school, if like the person next to you is sleeping, you would like kick them to wake them up. And if they didn't wake up, you would like tell the teacher that like Johnny passed out and needs to go to the nurse's office. And that's actually very similar to what happens in real life, in real life, in a virtual life, in, in a console uh, infrastructure. So all of the nodes around you are responsible for your being. They have a little data set of who they're able to talk to, how long it takes them to communicate. And what happens is if all of a sudden I don't see node five anymore and my other peers agree that node five is no longer there, together we will go and narc on node five and say, hey, node five has left the cluster. And at that point, console alerts. And that sounds like a very complex process, but it takes about 300 milliseconds. So it's incredibly fast for the nodes to have a consensus that somebody is removed or missing from the cluster. So that's how you no longer need TTL-based liveliness checks, because liveliness is determined by your peers. So to kind of wrap everything up, there are four basic problems in service-oriented architecture. You have the service discovery component. How do I find that thing over there? when I have 50 of them. More particularly, how do I load balance across all 50 of those things? How do I only send traffic to healthy hosts when I load balance across them? And how do I do feature flagging and toggling at runtime? There are also some things that console does that we didn't particularly talk about. It does leader election. It has its own internal leader election algorithm, but then when you combine that with something like console lock, you can implement your own leader election algorithms without doing lots of academic white paper research. If you already have a console cluster, you can leverage console to do leader election for services that don't have leader election built in by default. You have semaphore locking, things like rolling restarts, things like kernel upgrades, where you can isolate things across the system to perform interval changes um, on you know, some uh, semaphore style lock. It's highly responsive and it's scalable. So like I said before, we have clients who are pushing hundreds of thousands of requests per second through console and it does not die. Uh, it does not increase memory usage. It can handle pretty much anything at this point. 
Um, but at the same time, its monitoring solution is designed in a way where we're not sending unnecessary network traffic across the load. So you combine all of this together and, you know, console is definitely a very interesting solution. Um, I would encourage you to try it out. We've done a lot of work recently to make it easy to get started in development. So we added a dash dev flag, which means you can download console on your local machine and run it on your local machine with the dash dev flag, which enables a whole bunch of defaults. You don't have to create a config. You don't have to set anything up. You just get a cluster, and you're ready to go. So with that, I'm done, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you.